get close to your essence and what you believe in and what you want to create. Turn off the phone and create that art that makes you excited. Hi, we're Goldfish. I'm with Dominic, one half of Goldfish. An electronic duo originated from Cape Town, South Africa. South Africa's biggest export when it comes to music. Our whole thing is kind of combining the analog and digital world together. You're highly acclaimed as a musician. You guys did a residency in Ibiza. You've won multiple MTV awards. Life is sweet, man, if you let it be. I view music as soul nutrition. I want to make music that will have a message and a meaning behind it. What do you think of AI? An AI artist. Is this real art or am I being manipulated? I would never use it to create the art part of it because that's what you're here for. Why are we deleting ourselves from this equation? If someone did a blind test, there's two tracks. So the one track that they like is a AI generated track. Does it matter? Oh, wow. Welcome to this week's episode of the Vinny Vidi Vici Show. This week, I've got Dominic Peters in my studio, and he is a fellow South African like myself, and he also lives in San Diego, so I'm very excited to have him here. If you're looking for an unconventional path to success in life, this is the episode for you. We're going to cover a lot of Dominic's incredible journey across multiple continents and how he wound up being one of the most famous uh, halves of a DJ duo in the world, um, and his, his duo is called Goldfish. Uh, and he gets that name from you know having a really bad memory as a kid and forgetting things. So, uh, Dominic, welcome. Thank you for having me, Benny. It's awesome to be here. It's great to have you. So, you know, when I look at your, your background, uh, it's, uh, and I say it's unconventional, it really, really is. I mean, you were born in South Africa. Um, give us like a quick two-minute overview of, of just what it was like growing up and, and you know, being a yeah. musician. I actually was born in Zimbabwe, finally. Oh, enough, sorry. I moved down yeah. to Cape Town when I was four. Um, and I was just, uh, I was just really blessed to have just such supportive parents who kind of could see I was a little different, I guess. And they knew I was different and just let me be me. Yeah. But yeah, I grew up in Cape Town and um, <clears throat> went to a great school there, Ronabosch. But I definitely struggled as a kid to just like relate to other kids. It was just something, I don't know if I was like, just a little bit shy or um you know it was something on the spectrum but i was just i didn't feel like i really related to other kids so music became my best friend and i used to just play the piano for hours a day um just music became this other world for me it was like my metaverse so you discovered at a young age that you had a a, a rare form of synesthesia can you tell tell us about <laughs> that? tell us about that what, what is that and and like you know it obviously makes you very special and talented in this world well, that's debatable, but um, <laughs> uh, the funny thing about the synesthesia thing is I think maybe more people have it than they realize, but uh, because I was studying music and playing music, I think it, I was able to unlock my awareness of it as such. I guess I was about 10, and first of all, I kind of figured out that I had this thing called perfect pitch, which, which allowed me to hear notes on a scale to the notes on a piano, so I could hear, I could kind of uh, correlate where I was in a song based on the key in a in a unique way, and then subsequently discovered that all the notes on the piano in the scale, the A440 scale, have a corresponding color for me. Um, and A is yellow, B is green, C, it just runs up the color wheel. It's the craziest thing. And I thought everyone had this. And, um, you know, the, the limited uh, sort of socialization I had as a kid, they were, other kids were like, no, dude, I do not have this thing. What does that mean? So in like, if I hit a, a key on a piano, boom, you see a color? I see a color, I, feel, I hear a color, I guess. Uh, it's, I think some people have that with numbers as well. Uh, numbers become colors. I don't know exactly why that is. I think it's just a thing your brain has some sort of uh, mutation of the pathway or something. But um, I think it's led me to explore music in a different way um, and hear music in a different way, um, which is, it's it feels natural and normal to me, but... Um, I, I don't know if it's how everyone else does it. I've heard about this randomly from people who, you know, taken you know LSD and that sort of thing, <laughs> and, and and they developed this like you know. But you were ten, so I don't think you were taking <laughs> LSD. Still haven't. Yeah. So yeah. so it's a, it's a very a very natural sort of thing for you. Um, yeah. You're highly acclaimed as a musician. You guys did a residency in in Ibiza for like seven years. You've won multiple MTV awards. I mean, what a journey, right? And when you were growing up, and Ronabosch boys, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I remember I used to live down in Ronabosch actually for a while. No way. When I was at UCC, Similar yeah. When you were there, how did you how did you figure out that, you know, A, you wanted to go into music and B, like, how did you get out of 
you know, going out of you know school into the music career. Like, give us a little snippet there. Like I said, I was a very shy, quiet little uh, kid, and uh, music was literally my escape from the world. Um, as almost literally my best friend, and um, you know, it was just something that I I found. It, I guess it was my calling or something. I just knew it was just something. I like I'd get home from school, I'd just play the piano for five hours. Sorry to my folks. <laughs> At least it wasn't um, drums. <laughs> they were lucky to dodge the bullet there. My brother's a drummer. Oh, my Sorry, they didn't, do- they didn't dodge that bullet. Um, I think I found it was almost just like my superpower or something. It was like the thing where I didn't know how to be socially kind of uh, integrated within my peers. But via the music, they were like, huh, this guy's interesting. He knows every, he can play it. I can play like a song on the radio and I'll hear it and be able to instantly play it back to them. Mm. And then, you know, when I was about 13, I was like, okay, well, this actually, this works on girls too. And um, <laughs> this, could be, uh, this could be useful for me in my uh, not being able to talk to anyone, but I can, I can play music. And, um, and then obviously it was just, it was something I fell in love with and just um, started playing in bands and then studied music at the University of Cape Town. And that's where I met my, um, my musical counterpart, David. Uh, from Goldfish and we started the band and um, we've been on a crazy 17 year plus journey since that's awesome what year what years were you at UC uh, 99 to 2002 I think yeah did the Bima's bachelor's in jazz um, incredible uh, teachers there and lecturers the funny thing was uh, I was playing upright bass there weren't a lot of us in Cape Town so I would be called up by my lecturers like yo yeah. and the jazz will be like listen dad that's how they talk Basil can't make the gig can you make it and I'm like 21 and all these other guys are like in their 50s or whatever in yeah. their 60s and I'd be like this little blonde guy like showing up to this gig jazz, um, jazz gigs yeah and then I would go to the lecture the next morning and he'd like swing me some money like onto my like desk at at college, so that was kind of a strange. I was in the Cape Town music scene back then. I was managing a band. In the... Oh yeah, you told yeah, me that. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever cross paths with Kesavan and I do? Kesavan, I played in many bands. I with was in high school with him. No way. And he was like one of the best, best jazz drummers ever. Absolute genius. Worldwide. Yeah, yeah. So and great. We, we were in high school for. I mean, I've known him since I was like six. So we went through school together. Incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah he's. I think he's actually just saw he's back in South Africa doing a whole um, a piano orchestra thing. So yeah. yeah. I'm very excited for him. Kept too much jazz, maybe, but he's he was he was incredible at high school. So he he just soared. Yeah, another another ridiculous. person who found their calling. Hundred um, percent. Okay, so 2004, you guys started the band. We the, did. You know, the duo. How did you go from being a local South African couple of guys, you know, to to getting a, a gig in and a residency <laughs> in Ibiza? I mean, like this is a this is the stuff that you know made of dreams, right? People want to. Play in Ibiza at, at the, you know the top club in Ibiza. Which one was it? It was um, Pasha. Pasha. Pasha Ibiza. Yeah, oldest yeah. club in the world. Oldest club in the world. I mean, how did that, what a transition. And, and and when you guys go back to South Africa, I know you're going to go back in in December. The homecoming crowd is insane. I've been to one of your gigs um, in, in Cape Town, and you guys packed the house. I remember the one time I went to um, it was Shimmy Beach Club a few years ago to try and get in, and we didn't know each other back then, and the 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 person at the front desk, the girl at the front desk was like, sorry, you can't get in. I'm like, what do you mean? I want to go watch Goldfish. And she's like, this has been sold out for months. <laughs> so wow. it's like, I, you know, I mean, I had to text somebody and the manager got me in because <laughs> 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 he was like, I, know, I know people there. Next but, time if you have any problems, just, well, I know, just I know drop guy. me a text. But like, it's impossible to get into those gigs. They're like, they sell out months in advance. You, you're such a, um, you guys are such a, an iconic uh, band. We're honestly honored and grateful to have had that kind of loyalty from, you know, our home country and, um, you know, I think South Africans are always looking for something to celebrate um, because we have so many challenges and whether it's our rugby team or our musicians or our artists, whoever it is, you know, we get behind our people. Mm. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But I mean, our journey kind of started from just honestly the most innocent place, which is just a pure love of music. Dave and I were studying jazz and we'd be playing these background uh, you know, wedding gigs and hotel lobbies. I'd be sitting there playing the Mount Nelson, which is this sort of a high-end restaurant and hotel in Cape Town. People come down the stairs and be like, ah, oh, Brigadier. And I'd be playing like Girl from Eponema or Summertime. But and this then, story is the same story. I've, I've heard this so many times. Like all these great musicians, they basically have to bas- go busking. Yeah. Like, to, like that's what you have to do. Yeah, I mean, and and I was a student. It was, a, I mean, I guess it was kind of the equivalent of, you know, if I wasn't doing music i would have been a barista or you know doing a waitering job or what it would have been while i was studying but i was able to do music uh and it kind of fast-tracked me because i was playing 
all of these gigs at a very sort of relatively young age as a as a musician and i was hanging out with a lot of older artists which taught me a lot and kind of you know you learn a lot from those from those experiences and dave and i were like doing jazz and we'd invite our friends to come to the show and they'd be like that was interesting <laughs> but you know they were impressed by it but they weren't moved by it and Dave and I were growing up listening to Fatboy Slim and Crude and Dorfmeister, Saint Germain, all these jazzy, hybridized kind of versions of dance music. Jazz is dance music. And it was like, oh wait, we can we could do this. Cause we'd play a wedding and the DJ would take over playing some like jazz remix. And we're like, wait a second, we play all these instruments. Like, why don't we do this? <laughs> and so we, you know, back then it was, you know, you know, over, you know, 17 years ago, you know, the laptops weren't the way they were. So we were using hard yeah. like hardware and mixes and Creating the stuff vinyl? manually. Using lots of vinyl? Never used vinyl. Okay. It was all uh, hardware sequences. Dave used to bring a freaking 486 Pentium computer to trigger samples. Yeah. We'd like bring our studio to the club. And the first gig we did, our friends were like, when's the next gig? Like, what's this thing? And then we made a demo like song and my buddy played it at a, at a house party. He came back. He was like, everyone's like, what's that song? Can you make some more of that? And we were like, it was like the universe went, we've been waiting for you welcome you know Product once you fit. click on that thing you know <laughs> when you find that thing and and dave and i were like you you guys like this and um and then it was just off to the races suddenly you know we were doing a residency in cape town playing in camps bay to which club oh it was a tiny little club called barraza i remember barraza yeah, yeah, yeah it was a little yeah. on, tiny on C, spot on sea point was it on the main road on sea point road it was it was actually on camps bay main camps road, road. Yeah, it yeah. probably held maybe a hundred oh, yes, people yes, yes. next to that the hotel next to blues next, uh, next yeah, yeah, yeah yes and okay. um it there, was there was Paranga and there was par Paraza. Paranga was downstairs okay. and Paraza was okay. upstairs. Oh, yeah, yeah, next to the Blues restaurant. I don't even know what's called. Yeah, that was a small little tiny, hole tiny, hole. Yeah, a lot, yeah. you know, not much bigger than this podcast room. But uh, it would hold maybe you know seventy five hundred people. We would put two hundred people in there every Thursday, and it was just spreading like wildfire. And we got a, a kind of a break to go to Europe. Uh, uh, there was the World Advertising Awards in Cannes. And we got asked to play a party by the South African Film Commission. They flew us over. And we were doing this beach party. And we were like, dude, like Ibiza is like not that far away. We should, this is electronic music. We should go. The tickets back then were like, you know, close to a thousand euros because we're in freaking Cannes. Yeah. You know, Cannes to Ibiza was a pricey ticket. We had, you know, we we're still students, no, no money. Flew over there, no gigs. I knew one guy. Uh, it was a German guy who had come up to us at these gigs at Barraza and said, you know, if you're ever in Ibiza, I'll put you up. You can stay at my German tour resort, uh, tourist resort. It's kind of like spring break for uh, the German kids. And you can stay there. And if you can play a gig, you can uh, you can stay with us. So I was like, cool, did that. Showed up in the north of the island, which is nowhere near any of the cool clubs or Pasha. We had no idea we would even get a chance. And another South African, shout out to the South Africans, happened to be managing... Uh, Pasha Ibiza at the time uh, and he was friends with my South African manager Raymond Bloom and um, Mark Netta was his name is his name and uh, he said hey um, Pete Tong who's a BBC One DJ is playing the Sunset Party at Cafe Mamba which is the pre-party for Pasha uh, do you want to come like play 15-20 minutes before he comes in so we lugged all our suitcases over there set up sunsets anyone who's been to Ibiza knows it's all about the sunset I think Pete was having like a chicken burger. He was quite stoked that we were there. Gave him a break. He didn't have to start immediately. We set up uh, on two of the dining tables outside the DJ booth because we couldn't fit it in with all our gear. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened, you know, we did our sets and people were loving it. Just so happened that the uh, MD of Pasha was there, Danny Whittle, and he was like, what are you guys doing later? You want to come to the club and play a set? And we were like, well, yeah, our schedule's pretty open. So 4 a.m. went to Serendipity, another. Serendipity, man. Yeah, we did this uh, Did the set, went well, went up onto the terrace at Pasha. We're like, do you want a record deal? Do you want to come be residents here next year? And that was how it all started. And I think wow. it nearly didn't happen in so many ways. There's just so many variables of how that could have gone wrong. We got to, you know, when we were doing that opening slot, we were kind of coming in with all our equipment. They didn't have the right cabling. Dave went upstairs and found one RCA mono cable sweating we've got like our 15 20 minute like break to do this thing and like don't mess it up we plugged it in we played mono and we still got the gig but if we hadn't found that cable i don't know what you know things would have been very different right now wow i love hearing these stories <laughs> so okay 
so before we go too far forward from there, let's go back. What, what is the like moment of darkness for you where you really thought, I am not destined to be a musician that makes more, at least from a career perspective? Like, what is that, that deepest, darkest moment for you? I feel like that's daily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, well wind, back, wind back from before you actually figured out that like people wanted the music you were producing. Because that's, I think, something which a lot of musicians struggle with is, especially when you're trying to e- either create some sort of unique genre or fit into an existing one. Uh, you mm. know, like what what is the moment where you think I'm either I'm not good enough or like the moment of doubt that you have? I think every artist deals with this, like I said, daily. I don't. I think if you don't, you're either in denial or uh, superhuman. Um, I think most creativity creativity comes from, you know personal struggle or things that you're working out or it's just like your um it's your emotional solve you know something that just makes you feel good so um i would say the thing i struggle the most with is is staying true to that especially in this world where we have social media kind of like screaming at us the whole time about the algorithm and this and that and you've got to keep it punchy and you go like this is the new thing and dance music is very um it moves so quickly it's kind of like fashion mm. in a way, as, as opposed to we've always, as you know, music that we're trying to make, which is more timeless. Uh, you know, a dance track will be like hot for like six weeks, a couple months, six months if you're lucky, and then everyone's moved on to the next track. Um, so that's something I take that I struggle with for sure is the disposability that's kind of happened to music um, because we'll spend so much time working on a song or working on a thing. And, um, you know, it, it, can, it can kind of just rush by on the timeline of people's lives. People are busy. There's so much media being, you know, you know, what people are consuming and being pushed onto them. So I would say, you know, being OK with that and actually just getting back to, you know, the fundamental of why do you do this? I'm going to do this anyway. I love this. I'll find a way. It's a calling. You can't if you're doing this for external val- validation. I uh, I think you're gonna you're never gonna be able to fill that that hole. What advice would you give for your younger self? Like like let's say twenty years ago, what 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 advice do you think would have been very beneficial to have heard and listened to? Hmm. I mean, I was still so clueless about what I was doing. We were just in sort of a happy accident of doing what we loved, and some you know I was literally a background piano and bassist in Cape Town and then suddenly we were playing at the world's biggest club with David Guetta it was like this I didn't know what happened to me it was like this just just like lightning struck me and this crazy thing happened and you're naive and you don't necessarily have the tactical chops to know that there's this musical industry that's like Game of Thrones where there's people moving their chips around the board and um, I think I would have told my younger self to not get too concerned with trying to make it uh, because you have this thing and then you're like, oh, I need to replicate it. You know, like you need to just remember why you're doing this thing. And and I think the dangerous thing, it's almost like a, a law of nature where, especially with art, is that as, as soon as you shift from being, coming from a, a place of pure creativity and then going into like, oh, I need to recreate that thing that people like as opposed to going like, what is it that I like? Mm. What is the thing that makes me psyched and stoked? Because that's what's actually, people can smell when, you, um, when you're when you dancing their tune. You know, it's almost like in a relationship or if you're you know, hyper available for, for a person, it's like, ooh, that's not actually good. So I think our role as artists is, just, is as hard as that is in today's world is to stay 100% connected to your vision and your journey and your music whatever it is so talk about the ibiza experience i mean it's seven years in the the hottest club in the world uh, you know long hours how did you stay healthy how did you like because like you're probably djing until four or five in the morning and and like how do you maintain your health and uh and mental acuity because i'm sure it's tough right lots of alcohol whatever like for sure how do you do it um i think we're lucky in that Dave and I are definitely, we're not like party animals. We're psyched on music. We're not there for the good times. We're there to make the music and to make those moments. And, and I know that about you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, well, it's one thing I will say. Um, 
you know, for more like uh, and hanging out together. Like a, a glass of good wine is good enough. Yeah, I don't need to like put six teaspoons of sugar in my coffee. Yeah. It's like, can life is sweet, man, if you let it be. Um, so I think that would really helped us just as a starting point to you know because you could easily get swept up in mm. the nightlife and Ibiza scene. And I watched many people, you know go through that, whether it was Avicii, Eric Morello, you know, who lost a lot of people to mm. this this life. It'll spit you out and, you know, drop you at, at a moment's notice. You knew Avicii? Yeah, we played with him a bunch. We did a remix for him. It's pretty um, sad. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he was a very private and quiet guy. I never obviously like, got to like interact with him much, but um, yeah, it's, it's this, you know, we're all musicians. We're all uh, sensitive souls, and he was a very sensitive guy. Um, but um, yeah, just not getting too caught up in that party scene. I think I had a, I had an inkling of like, it wasn't real for me. Like I had my, I had a higher purpose of why I was there. So we would like, we used to play like a Thursday night before David Guetta and we'd have like a 4 a.m. slot at the club sometimes. But that's before he goes on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he would go on around 4 a.m. but we would be in another room sometimes or we'd be on the main stage. Uh, and I would set my alarm for like 2 a.m. in the morning, wake up, you know, splash some water in my face and then like arrive at the club and it'd be like, what is going on in here? There's like, you know, people have been here for, you know, f four or five hours sending it. Um, so, you know, you see a lot of wild and people are having their release and that's what I'm there to do is to try and kind of, uh, but did you get into a schedule? Were you doing gym every day or what were you doing? Uh, when I lived in Ibiza, I used to do cliff jumping. So that was cliff. Jumping. I lived right by this uh, Talamanca Beach, this beautiful beach. And how were, high? Oh, it wasn't that high. It was probably like twelve meters, or it was about as high enough that while you're falling, you're like, I'm still falling. Okay. Uh, but I used to do that every day. Um, and obviously, the ocean um, is just a huge part of my life. I love surfing. Yeah. Not much surfing in Ibiza, but yeah, I'd be in the water every day, swimming, paddleboarding, cliff jumping. So this is why you chose San Diego. Amen. Yeah. San Diego was like, where can I live in America that's like Cape Town? Close to major centers like LA, I can get to anywhere in the US. Yeah, Cape Town's so, my favorite city I've ever lived in. Um, it's, yeah, an incredible place. You know, I mean, I, I would say it's probably San Diego now, that's why I chose to live here, but it's because it's like Cape Town. 100%, uh, with, yeah. With, 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 with better power supply. Yeah, there's that. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love Cape Town is the, the power situation. It's also just geographically very far from everything. You might as well be living in Tasmania if you want to run a, a music career from there. So, you know, it was 12 hours to just get to London or anywhere that you could play a gig on an international kind of scale. So how'd you go from Ibiza to America? What is the... So we did seven years in Ibiza, uh, and that was incredible. We opened for David Guetta for many years. We used to play a beautiful club called the Blue Marlin. And I felt kind of like we got typecast in a supporting role. Uh, you know, we were kind of like, oh, there's those, those great South African guys with the saxophone and the bass. We'll get them on. You know, they'll bring some crowd in and it'll be great. But we were always, we were never going to be able to ascend to the level we would have liked to being that role. Um, and of course, it was an incredible time. We learned a lot. Um, you know, being in Ibiza was like dance floor university. You know, I, just watching the most, I was there when, uh, you know, Will I Am arrived in the club and kind of, got on the mic spontaneously with David Guetta, and then we got that whole EDM boom in the US. I, at the time, we were like, oh, wow, there's Will I Am doing this thing, and then that became I Got a Feeling at most downloaded song wow. on iTunes and all these things. We were just standing behind the DJ booth, like watching this all go down. Um, and that was an incredible time, and I um, learned so much and had so much uh, value from that, but it was like we'd reached a ceiling of what we could achieve, and it was like, well, we're touring around America and flying back between, you know, the U.S. and Cape Town and 30 hours door to door, arriving, going straight into a show. And it was just killing us. And it was like, well, you know, why don't we just come base ourselves here? And mm. since then, it's been incredible. We've got to play Red Rocks, Lollapalooza. Burning Man. Burning Man. You had a huge had a great crowd time, Burning yeah. Man. Yeah, huge crowd. Yeah, Coachella, all these, these opportunities that... Um, I wouldn't say it's always been easy because we're kind of coming here and sort of starting over. And breaking and, it into the market. Exactly. Now. But we're not afraid of that. It's like, you're building go a, back to gym. You're building a good brand. You got a new album out, uh, If Summer Was a Sound. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, after, you know, so many years and six albums, I kind of had this question while I was surfing one day, just down, literally down here in La Jolla. And I was like, how do I describe to someone who hasn't, hasn't discovered goldfish or what we're about or how I'm, you know, how would you describe our music? And 
I kind of just came up with this phrase, you know, like if summer was a sound, it's like we we're trying to create that beautiful summery good time feeling because that's who we are as people. Um, very much about beach and outdoor life, um, and so yeah, it's kind of been the culmination of our last, I'd say, six years in the U.S. and creating these songs and trying to always weave. Um, some messaging into our music because a lot of dance music is quite functional it's about just freaking keeping p- people on the dance floor and that's great but uh, I want to make music that will have a message and, and a bit more um, kind of meaning behind it it's not just a functional sort of A to B point thing um, so yeah we've I sort of sometimes kind of compare this to being a chef uh, and it's like cool the kids want cheeseburgers and it's like okay I can deal with that Let's make a cheeseburger, but I want to make you the best cheeseburger you have ever had. I'm going to sneak in some camembert on there. There's going to be some foie gras, whatever it is. And they're going to be like, what was that? And I'll be like, doesn't matter. Did you like it? You've got to kind of give it to people in a way that they can receive it mm. um, and try and sneak in the things that are important to you in a way that uh, allows them. You can be the gateway into them discovering more in dance music, I think. Let's del- delve into the business side of running a, a you know a brand like Goldfish. Like, who, who do you have around to support you? Because I'm, you know, you guys are playing gigs and trying to get some sleep in between, um, composing, doing whatever you do as a musician. How do you build this brand and and produce the album? Like, who do you have around you? We have a great team around us, and and that's a huge part of you know our success and how we do things. But I would say it actually still starts with Dave and I. You know. Uh, I think the I think I heard you say this. It was like if you're starting a business or you're starting a project, don't go it alone. Get a partner. Um, and I was so lucky to have found Dave, and and we had a mutual friendship and affinity, and we've been through so much together. But we are where it all stops. It's the it stops with us. We're responsible for everything. We if something doesn't work out, who can I blame? No one, myself or Dave or ourselves. You guys run your own social media as well. Um, we do. We've got people who help us with it and do the, the nuts and bolts. Um, but uh, it, yeah, having a team around you is obviously important and that's a huge part of what we do. And Our management are incredible. Our agent's incredible. Uh, but they can only do so much if we're not functional. You know, we need to be, we need to be like connected to what we're doing and, um, you know, as myself being more of an artistic kind of guy the business side of things is not necessarily my strong point um and i'm very lucky in that dave is being apart from being an incredible musician he's he's a lot more kind of business minded so we have a yin and a a yin and yang thing going on and we're able to play to each other's strengths and then on top of that the layers of who we work with and uh, jay our manager in new york um you know he's a huge part of what we do and planning and strategizing and yeah we've got a, a great team and very grateful for them what advice would you give to you know like aspiring musicians and in, in, in figuring out like their their niche like is it just trial and error and keep doing different things and trying different things out or is there some sort of mental model that you have mm. i think it's really hard today because there is we have we've we're in a, in a world right now where social media is just so influential on us. We're we're getting like we're just getting like relentlessly tapped. Like this is the way you do things. You've got to like perform for the algorithm. You've got to like jump dance to this tune, and you're constantly being shown what your contemporaries are doing. Or this DJ or this artist just released this. Oh, he's played there or she's played here. Are oh, they doing this thing? They've released a new merch line. It's like what am I? No, no. You need to focus on what you're doing and what you believe in. And to stay close to that while you're having this cascade of information, I think is a huge challenge for any artist, but specifically young artists who have grown up with social media, is to try and get close to your essence and what you believe in and what you want to create and um, turn off the phone and, and create that art that makes you excited. And then from there, people will smell that. I feel like it's like blood in the water for sharks. It's like when when you discover an artist where you go, that is exactly what he's supposed to be doing or that is exactly what she's supposed to be doing. I remember seeing, you know, Fred again. I was like, who is this guy? This is He's doing nothing that anyone's ever done in a, quite the same way. And he's literally filming the dustman 
and making a dance track and releasing it two days later and then videotaping some guy, you know, he, he's not playing by the rules. He's playing by his rules. Um, so get get to what is your essence first and then go from there. Don't dance to everyone else's tune. I guess you're saying that authenticity is what's going to stand out. Crazy concept. <laughs> and we, I, exactly, right? This is so, This is it, it is a crazy concept because right now with social media and the algorithms and the search engines and, and social media algos, um, they favor repetition because the algos learn what works and tries to repeat that. So if you do what someone else has done, you're going to get a lot more views and attention, but you're not really being authentic. Yeah. And so what you know, I think what I'm hearing you say is be authentic. Be who you want to be and ignore the, the hype factor, at least in the short term. I mean, if you break out and a lot of the guys who break out eventually were the ones who are authentic for a long period of time. Yeah. And eventually... Um, they have their moment. Yeah, you, you have your moment where people just recognize that they're bored of the, the what the algo recommends and they want something different. That model could work for some artists. I mean, there's some guys who and girls who play that game and are very good at it, and that that's almost their skill set is that they are they're not necessarily artists as more natural marketers, um, which is obviously a big thing in a lot of dance music is that a lot of it is kind of like focus group driven in a lot of ways i feel like there's like a team behind this ghost producing someone's more just the face of a project and there's just people behind it and that bothers me on a fundamental level as a, as someone who's trying to be an authentic artist because i feel like it's like mini van vanilla again you know it's like what are we watching here is this real is this am i is this real art or is this am i being manipulated what do you think of ai and AI artists and AI characters that are being created right now that can do play music perfectly, they look real, they act real. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, and, and no, no, like no dig to someone like Marshmallow, because I, I love his music, but like when I go to a Marshmallow concert, I'm not sure it's the real Marshmallow playing on stage because he's got, a, he's got a, a hat on, right? So it could be, it could be, there could be five of them. We just wouldn't know. And that's kind of an example of a real life, um, a real life way of being, you know, duped because we, we just don't know. And in, in the online world, it's even worse. Like now, you have these virtual characters, virtual artists. You don't even know the music's generated by a real person or not. And and then I guess does it matter if, if you enjoy True. the music? Does it really matter? You whether, could you could argue that yeah. it's like, I mean, there was resistance to DJs when uh, CDs came along. Right. Everyone was like, no real vinyl. You need to mix this way. Even digital digital music musicians, right? So yeah, people not playing an actual instrument. There's resistance to that too. I think it's kind of like arguing whether we should all be still riding penny farthings when we're doing like the Tour de France. You know, like what are we, what are we doing here? At the end of the day, the whether it's like using a calculator to make a calculation quicker so that you can get further along. You're using. I think we've got to use AI because I know that I understand the hesitancy, but it's here. It's never going anywhere. So it's like trying to ban the calculator. Just we need to embrace it. Be useful in, in how we're using it and be careful with it. How are you using AI? I would love to use it a lot more. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing with it right now? Uh, I'm, using it, I'm using it a lot with uh, mixing. We, um, we use it in recordings uh, that we need to like, pull out a vocal from. Sometimes we get a, a sample or a recording from a show and it's just a stereo recording. We can literally pull out a vocal and treat it, make it a bit louder. What tools before, are you using for it? I think we use a we're using one. I think it's called Lana.ai. Okay, so you're already like you know using AI as a musician. I like to use it as a tool. I would never use it to create the art part of it because that's what you're here for. Sure. Why are we deleting ourselves from this equation? Yeah. You know, we want to be. I want to. I, I want it to be my fingerprints on the music. I don't want to feel like I've outsourced it to a machine. How far away do you think we are from having a number one hit generated purely by an AI? I mean, it's pretty hard to imagine how good this thing's going to get and how it'll be able to um, analyze all pop music and just like take the database of all incredible yeah. music that we all love and then be go, I'm going to make the ultimate song. That's kind of like Pandora on steroids, right? Yeah. Like Pandora worked really well because it had this uh, algorithm which was able to analyze what I type. love Pandora. I love Pandora too. I, st I still subscribe to it. So Because no, it, it's able to find good tracks similar to the music you like because of certain things and I'm not a musician so I know that maybe there's certain chords that, that I tend to like songs that have those chords in it and it finds more for me but the AI is like Pandora on a whole new level I'm sure Pandora is busy using AI now to improve as, as well but um, that's the good side of it I guess is just like helping it to 
expedites our discovery and enjoyment factor of music. And uh, probably the other side of that would be just being used because we're being lazy mm. or we're using it not necessarily with the right intentions. The deeper question really is, is music an expression of humanity and individualism or is it something which is meant to just be a consumption, uh, an object of consumption for humans? Like, do we care whether, if we had an AI throwing out millions of songs and you kind of find the ones you like and don't like and there's no real human producing it, does it devalue the human experience because now it's just proliferating music? I view music as, as soul nutrition. It's like, this is the food for the soul. Um, and what do you want to eat? Mm. Do you want to eat McDonald's or do you want to eat freaking lab meat or do you want to eat don't know, some processed you, thing? If you or? don't know, can you tell the difference? If someone did a blind, like a, you know, like there's a blind test, says, hey, here's two tracks or five tracks. Which one do you like? And one, and, and this would say the one track that they like is a AI generated track. Does it matter? I don't think it matters because you're right. It's at the end of the day, if it's making you have a visceral feeling and then it's touching you in your soul and you, you have an emotional connection to that, that just shows how good, I guess, AI is going to get. Right now, uh, it's pretty hard to tell because I don't, we're talking about like whether we want something to have soul or not. Or we want to have that relatability to that human of going like, oh, they wrote that song about a breakup or a tough time in their life or a happy time in their life. I don't know <laughs> if I mean, we're going to get to that. My, I'll give you my personal view as someone who's, um, you know, been to so many concerts and, you know, I used to manage a band and whatever else. I think, like, listening to music is one thing. So sitting on my desk, uh, there's often, like, music which is, like, you know, I mean, you, you, there's lots of, like, Endel and lo-fi, whatever. Right. Just, like, focus music, right? You don't really care that it's not human-based, it's an algo-based, it's functional. Gets When I go to a music concert, I love seeing the person up on stage. I love the energy that they create. Like I was at a Coldplay concert uh, about a month ago, two months ago, where you know Chris Martin pulls up the, this couple on stage, has this amazing moment, like ad libs a song, you know, creates a song about them, and plays it back. You know, it's part of the, it was part of like Up and Up. He, he took Up and Up and he like re, you know re reimagined it for them, and it was such a special, amazing, beautiful moment. I'll remember that forever. Yeah, exactly, and, and I do too. And I, yeah, I posted it on Twitter. I, I recorded it. It was I think it was amazing. I don't think that humans are going to go to a concert where there's a, a computer playing music for them, right? So, for sure. So I think the the personality behind the music is so so critical right now, and I think it's we we the authentic, authenticity. It's and we celebrate, you know, I think humanity by supporting musicians. Um, and as someone who's a tech guy, who's into tech, I think I think there's a there's a time and place for AI music and AI generated tracks. I just don't think it's for. Uh, for community and, and for soul, sure. soul soul building and imagine going to Burning Man and there's a <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no DJ on stage uh, there's just a you know a, a, you can just a, have our Spotify playlist yeah. maybe there's a Tesla robot playing yeah. <laughs> I mean I'd go watch that just for the just the <laughs> shits and giggles intrigue like wow this is where we've got to yeah okay. where is life imitating art and art imitating life yeah exactly that, that is the conundrum what do you think about your plans for the future like where do you want to go with goldfish <sighs> great question um i feel like on our last album which we've just released if someone was a sound dave and i were chatting about this the other day um that was like a completion of a chapter for us um it's the last six years moving to the u.s acclimatizing making new friends going through you know personal challenges um, learning so much um, and it feels like that's done now that's complete I'm really happy with that time capsule when you listen to that album I think you'll get a time capsule of who we are as musicians and as, and as people um, but I'm really excited to explore uh, what else we can achieve that isn't necessarily what people are expecting from us I feel like we've given obviously what we want to do um uh in this album but i'm excited to ex kind of explore new styles new i also like creating limitations for myself um, because with the today's world there's like you have infinite possibilities and that can be a terrible thing because within limitations comes creativity and you're going to come up with a thing completely differently when you only have a few a few tools 
Uh, it's like when you're in the kitchen, you want to make a pasta and all you've got is, you know, one piece of garlic, a chili and a couple of tomatoes or whatever it is. And you can make something magical yeah. or you can mess it up. Yeah. Um, when you, you, you know, you have a fridge full of everything. Yeah. So uh, I think we'd like to uh, limit ourselves down to a few of our basic items of just like what we are as, as musicians, just like a saxophone, an upright bass, a piano, one synthesizer and a laptop and go, what can you make with this? You don't need all the extra stuff. I always say scarcity is the mother of innovation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, and I think you'll, because we, 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 it's like we put too much makeup on things sometimes. You want to like let the true beauty come through. So I, I'm excited to do something. I, maybe people won't like it, but I know we will. We'll publish your, your, your upcoming tour, right, uh, in, in the show notes below. And um, I think there'll be, yeah, it's just, I think it's, it's, It'll be great to see this chapter of your life sort of you know coming to fruition in, in, in live in person. I'm looking forward to I think seeing you next Friday night. Um, you'll be playing you'll be playing some of the new album, right? All of it, all of it, fantastic. Yeah. So sorry everyone, you're dealing with it. New album time, <laughs> <laughs> new album time, and then you'll be in Cape Town for yeah uh, for December. We've got some shows in South Africa. We've got some shows around the U.S. Um, next year we'll be up in Aspen and doing a whole snowboarding tour around all the snow spots. When are you in Aspen? It'll be in Aspen January twentieth, I believe. Okay, uh, that's uh, the then, MLK weekend. Yes, ski weekend. Okay. Yes, and uh, then we'll be up in Idaho and Park City and a whole bunch of other places. So that's that's always really fun is being able to take your music and go play some parties and get up on the slopes or get in the water, go surfing. That's been what we're, we're always about. If winter was a sound, it'll be our next album. <laughs> <laughs> That's another one. Um, okay, give, it, give, me some, give me a book recommendation that you have for the audience. Oh, wow. What's your favorite book of all time? Um, Medium Raw by Anthony Bourdain. Okay. Anthony Bourdain was just a, an incredible uh, cultural observer. I think as not even as a you know his chef obviously he started as a chef but his real talent was observing the world and calling bullshit on a lot of stuff and I really I really enjoy his take on things sadly not you know we lost him but yeah. um I love that book yeah that's a that's a huge one and then um, I think aside from that the four agreements just on the other side of the spectrum it's the simplest book in the world and it's got everything you need and so hard to apply in our daily lives just four simple agreements okay yeah um thank you what's your what's your one habit you think everyone should have every day hmm be kind to yourself yeah we so often aren't yeah that's very true it's very very true what's the best bit of financial advice you've ever received don't take financial advice from dom <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife will tell tell me that too uh, I'm uh, you know like I said I'm an artist and a creative first so I definitely don't think that's my strong point um, definitely in spite of myself I've managed to still have a great a great life and achievements but um, that's definitely uh, I would say uh, especially for artists that is actually a very well yeah that's a good question it's just I would say Surround yourself with people that you can trust in, in your finances. Good advice. What's the one misconception that, like, what's your pet peeve that people always get wrong about life or business that you just, like, always have to correct them? That's a good question. I mean, I think my, my ultimate pet peeve is littering. <laughs> it's, I don't know why that uh, it literally you, yeah. makes me see red because it's like we yeah. know better yeah. and people still do it. Well, I was in Japan, like, a week ago, and, you know, there's no trash cans throughout the whole city. It's incredible. It's like, there's no tra and there's no trash. Yeah, people just don't let it. They don't. They, you know, they, you, you you get a takeaway. You eat it where you are, and you throw it away. You don't walk around eating food. Or this is our home. Cups. This yeah. world is our home, and like you wouldn't litter in your own home. Why would you just throw something? I, out? I wish we could learn from the Japanese. Yeah, like this. I just I think it's the most incredible place. I uh, become almost uh, psychotic about <laughs> when I see this stuff. When especially when I, as a surfer, and I just see someone in just ocean, throw yeah. something in the on the beach. I, yeah, I've scared some people. <laughs> but I, I hope that that you know has shifted them into not being i would say that is definitely my pet peeve i don't know if that was constructive but it is a big one if you go back in time and meet one person who would it be oh so many did you ever meet nelson Mandela? i did oh very I lucky did. I, I didn't but yeah uh, oh yeah well first of all that man yeah um i'll tell a quick story about that 
uh, we were asked to play 4664 yeah. back in the day uh, when he was still with us. I was and at that concert. Were you? Yeah, oh, my goodness. Time, yeah. yeah, and the lineup was ridiculous. It was like Annie Lennox and yeah. Ludacris and freaking all these guys. We were all in a line to meet Nelson Mandela. And his assistant, I can't remember her name now, it's a very sweet lady, uh, was like sort of corralling us. And it, literally, Annie Lennox was in front of me. Behind me was Ludacris, and there was Kareen, Kareen Bailey Ray, and then Dave and I just standing there. I was 27 at the time. And while I was in the line to like walk in, and he's chilling in an armchair just like this, it occurred to me that I was 27, and that was how many years he was put in jail for fighting for what he believed in and for fighting for the freedom of our country. And it had not occurred to me once that it was Annie Lennox in front of me or that <laughs> Ludacris was behind me. And it had not occurred to them either because in that moment, everything we had done was completely irrelevant. It's just freaking music. Yeah. This guy had dedicated his life to saving a country. And um, we were all humbled in that moment. It didn't matter that she was Annie Lennox. It didn't, it was, we were like nobody. It was like, as we all are. But um, it was just such a a powerful sort of realization of, you know, just humbling and then walking into the room and they're like, so this is goldfish. And he's like, ah, goldfish. And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, just just to have had that moment and and just what he went through and, and came out with such, um, you know, he healed, a, he healed everyone, everyone's kind of pain, even if it was temporarily, so we could get past a, a really difficult moment in our country's career and avoid a civil war and all the things that could have happened. He, it's, yeah. One of the greatest men of all time. So yeah, I'm, I would say that, yeah, that was someone I'm, I would love to meet again. Um, yeah, he's an inspiration to so many. Well, we, I don't think we can end on a better note than that. Dom, thank you so much for being in the studio. It's really been a pleasure and it's been great having you and uh, good luck with all all the touring. Thank you so and, much. Uh, I'll see you at, at, at as many concerts as I can attend. It's a date. <laughs> see you, man. Yeah, man.